Okay, so um, I, I'll, I'll uh, l l let me comment on uh, two things first, and then I'll just um, the various things I could talk about, but I will just then advertise a few things for you to to read because I don't have time to to go over them in detail. But so um, one uh, one <coughs> let me respond again to the um, to Paolo's question. So um, so he asked me um, in the intuition that that I the, the the type of formula that that I wrote that S the what the the simulation or the real universe, the motion in the real universe are S perturbation theory plus S um, error. And I was saying SI, SJ of the error. Let's just take this simple example in which this was just sigma squared delta J, okay? It looks like, um, it looks like this. We'll just add, uh, and on the other hand, I was showing you this, um, this, um, picture in which you see that the, that the, um, the halo, of course, is more concentrated than where you end up in the simulation. And, and from this type of formula, it looks like uh, this S error only adds, if I'm adding some sort of variance to it, it only adds more puffiness, okay? So it looks like it even goes in the opposite direction. And so wh what I said was, well, uh, Either you can think of this as uh, sigma square, so there's some part of the displacements of the perturbation theory that are overdoing the thing, and so part of this sigma square will have to be negative to subtract that out, or perhaps you can think that you, uh, you have cut off, uh, I said uh, there was, the, what I said here was uh, m closer to the, to the physical, of what actually is going on. So, in the perturbation theory, things were coming together, then they were going through, so you probably need to put a cutoff, and you stop the perturbation theory there, and then this S error is just the final little motion to make the, to make the, um, the halo puffier. But when, when uh, in other words, you, you take the perturbation theory, if you put some sort of cutoff, you take the perturbation theory almost to the point of the collapse, they are, and then you add some little error like that, uh, that then it will be positive. Um, but I can tell you exactly what, uh, what happens. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm describing, of course, I, I suggest that you go read these papers because they are more sophisticated. I'm describing it, everything uh, in the most, uh, most uh, basic way looks everything very trivial, okay? I, on purpose, I'm trying to just stick to something very simple that we can all get our heads around. Um, so then I can tell you exactly what's going on in the simulations, okay? Because I, I know, I, if I have a simulation, I know this, I know this, I know that. So I can tell you exactly how this is, this, uh, this is actually working on the simulation and it's working in the following way. So schematically, I also told you that you can think of the, you can think of the, um, of this field of displacement as a very big vector, I said, S nonlinear as a function of Q that I measured in the simulation. So this just means, uh, the, is, this is for, uh, as I was doing for the potential of the displacement, but just to, if, if you want, I can do for the big S, but it doesn't matter. So uh, the displacement of each of the particles in the simulation, and I was expanding it as a, as a, as a vector, as a linear decomposition in some psi i of perturbation theory, or where I here is the first order, second order, okay? So the output of the simulation is for a particle that started in Q, how much it moved, I'm inventing that this is some sort of perturbation theory plus the, this error, extra error, okay? And I can exact, so these are all very particular patterns of in, in the, in, Think of them as maps of how the particles uh, move in, the, in this box of the simulation. So I have, if you want, some set of templates, and 
there was the initial conditions, and then I generate a few other templates, and I'm looking exactly how, um, how what the, the, the map, which is this very big map, look, how it looks similar or not to those templates. And so I can, comp I can measure this A as a function of K for each of the orders in perturbation theory. And what will you discover is the following. You will discover, so in other words, this is asking the question, how much of the actual motions in the simulation, how, do they, how much of them they look like the thing that you're predicting in perturbation theory? And as a function of k, these quantities look something like this. They start, there's one here. Let me, schematically, they start like this. And they go to zero, OK? At some k. They all more or less do the same thing. So, this is just telling you that when you look at the, when you look at the actual motions, the, 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 low, the, the low K motions are the ones that perturbation theory is telling you. The other ones don't look anything like it. So in this decomposition, basically, in some sense, you see it by measuring directly this cutoff thing. So Every, anything that the perturbation theory is predicting for the S or for this AI as a function of K at high K is no, no, looks nothing like the simulation. So if you, you do, if you are expanding this in this vector, you are putting zero for this coefficient. So, so this S perturbation theory, if you want here, has these AI coefficients that at some point are really zero. The, the motions have nothing to do with what you're predicting with the, and so, Indeed, everything moves. This part, this corrected perturbation theory that has these transfer functions, this is just much smaller than the full thing. And then, I mean, now when I'm dividing, everything here is positive. There's no imagine. This is just like vectors, right? So this guy, the variance of this is the sum of the variance of this plus the variance of this. Everybody's positive and so on. And it's working out compared to that because, indeed, the motions that I'm putting, I, I, the perturbation theory motions are not the ones that are generated by this, but you first are cutting it, they are being cut off, and then you are adding something else, okay? So, uh, in other words, this, the, yeah, this is just an explicitly looking at the motions that are predicted by perturbation theory and explicitly looking whether they are in the simulations, they look like that or not. And at high k, they don't look at all like that. Everything at high k becomes eventually the part that you cannot predict, OK? And you can also see that uh, as you go to higher order in perturbation theory, this cutoff is moving in this direction in some sense. So it's more junk. Uh, in, so, in some sense, the, the higher order things contain more and more junk. So um, and, and, and you can, that you can also see in the if you just were to start adding the, 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 in, the, in the numerical simulation, if you were just adding the motions of Seldovich, 2LPT, 3LPT, and you keep adding, you see that they are th making things worse for the most part. I mean, there's, because, you, because you, are sen you are sensitive to this part. If you, if you, if you cut them off as, as, you, as you measure like this, then they are improving things. But the, the higher order moments both improve the low cape stuff, but basically, each, each new loop that you add, at low k, does a good. But at high k, it does bad. And so when you look at a picture like that, that you have put everything together, you're, you're overwhelmed by the bad things that you're also including. And so you'd better do something, stop the integral. OK. Um, yeah? No, I didn't do that. I, I, I would claim that that's, uh, OK, with one exception that I would might get. Sorry? I don't think in practice that, uh, OK, there's some, um, uh, if I have time, which might, might, might or might not happen, I talk about this IR resumation, which is something that um, I advertised at the beginning about this BAO. That's I one place where I think adding more diagrams um, 
makes sense. There's a reason for why they should do better. But uh, I, think, I think in the nonlinear regime, from all I see, all the evidence that I see, um, this series is just not converging. And, um, and so there's no point in fishing some, um, some subset of the diagrams. At least where I see it more clearly is in this example of one plus one dimension that I said, where you can add them all and you can see that you are converging to something that is not uh, the right answer. So I don't think that this, series, this perturbation theory at high K is just is giving the right answer, and it's just that I haven't added enough diagrams, or there's something out there. Perhaps I, I don't have a theorem that that's not the case, but I don't. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that that's what's happening. So one can try, but I mean, I, um, yeah. So I think I think in reality, if uh, if you want to describe things that are happening on small scales, I think you're much better off start thinking with the halo model. Because that's really what's happening. And I think uh, it, it's, um, I, I don't see how by adding more terms here you will end up describing the motions inside the halos and stuff like that. That's clearly outside of the range of the validity of it. And because I know that what happens is that you form these halos, I just cannot see how you're going to improve the story by doing these kind of things. So my evidence would be the following, or intuitions, OK, of my intuitions. One, I see these halos with my eyes, OK? I see the halos, OK? And I find it not believable that the orbits of particles within the halo I will be able to get by, by doing this, OK? And you know, you. you in some sense, you can think of this as some sort of crude thing that is only taking a few time steps. And in the halo, the thing moves around really fast. How can you do it with a few? Just doesn't make sense to me. And so halos are very important. I see them. I, can, I don't think I can describe the orbits of things in this way. And second of all, the abundance of halos, as I was saying the other day, dn dm, its formula, roughly speaking, is some sort of exponential or minus delta c square over some power spectrum, uh, okay? So inverse of the power spectrum. This is, it cannot be expanded in the way that it's like this. So everything points to me that on small scales, an expansion in powers of the power spectrum is doomed. But perhaps not. I don't know. But I, so I think for me this is super convincing that when I go to the nonlinear regime, it's not going to work, okay? Now, let's discuss uh, perhaps the practical thing. So there is the nonlinear scale. I don't know exactly what it is, depending on, let's call this point 0.3k of, at redshift 0. It, of course, it depends on redshift. OK? So in this side, um, we can do this, and we can get, uh, by adding a few parameters to take into account this, these errors that we are making, we can do pretty well. So, there's this EFT thing, you can be more sophisticated. Then let's say that here somewhere is the halo model, okay? That is very, it's what's going on with your eyes. You can see that's what's going on. So it would be good to have something, uh, and, 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 uh, and, um, and people have tried for a long time to have something that combines these two things and more or less gives good answer that, in any case, this is not, uh, such a long distance, right? So maybe this is a factor of a few in K. So if all you're caring about is like something at the percent level, probably you can get something that works okay. And people have done it. So um, in the for what, what definitely, what's called the halo model is do linear theory here, something that gives you the same as linear theory here, and something that looks like halos at the very end and some formula that goes in between, okay? And so I think this is useful and it would be good to, um, it would be good to, um, to try to come up with a formula like that, maybe more for phenomenal, I mean, I don't think this kind of formula will be at any time as, as 
controllable as, as these formulas with the EFT that are, I think as you go at low K, you know exactly what should happen because of the symmetries and so on. So this, I think you can make them very, very accurate. This stuff, uh, not so much, I don't think, but probably percent is okay, yes. So you say, um, you, you're saying, for example, I have some formula in SPT for, so there's the linear calculation of SPT, there's the one loop calculation, and you're going to replace inside of this integral. Yeah, okay, so now this goes into the direction of let's start trying stuff. And yeah, there's a lot of that, and so okay, maybe. But my problem with let's start trying stuff usually is that, um, how do you know that uh, it's going to work? Usually you don't know. You try with the simulation. If it's good, you are happy. But then what's the point? Because by you're doing the simulation. So I think it's, it, if it's just going to be some sort of fitting formula, it's perhaps useful for practical purpose for the data, but it's, it's not gaining so much understanding. I think this guy, you gain some understanding because you're using the symmetries and so on, and you can try to do things very precise. The halo model is clearly what's going on. You see these halos in the simulation. The galaxies stretch the halos. You know the abundance of them. You can more or less calculate them. You count them. So you're clearly, at least at a f maybe not as precise as this one, but still it's really capturing what's going on, okay? And all these halos have a similar profiles. People have been able to measure. So you're kind of, somehow is a way of accumulating a lot of these things that, then if you're just, if you match them, okay, probably we can just match them in any kind of phenomenological way. This is to a percent here, a percent there. We just match, it's only just close your eyes, do something, it will be okay in the middle, okay? But that, um, yeah, that's, that's probably. But, um, yeah, so may maybe in this, um, um, yeah, so, so let me just make a comment about this, um, about trying to, because some people have tried to do something along these lines, um, which, um, um, for example, Uros and so on, they, they, are not, they are not doing this because they hate this EFT, but uh, they, they are doing the, the linear theory or something like that. But so, and they, they have some fitting formulas that, so this is at this level. So let me try to comment on this a little bit. I, I'll leave you as an exercise because um, I don't have so much time. But um, so, um, good. So le, 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 imagine you are computing the power spectrum or some two-point function like we are doing. So, um, so let's say you, you, are, you are doing it in, 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 so the formula that we have was an integral, an integral d cube q for delta e to the ik. So let me just say that it's individual particles in the simulation. So sum over the individual particles of the simulation, e over q plus s of q, okay? Or si, each of the particles. So maybe you should call it j because there's i here. Okay, um, so, um, so this is what you are going to do, okay? So this is your delta of K in the simulation, great. So uh, when you compute the two-point function, delta delta is really the square of this, so there's the sum over J1, there's the sum over J2 of this E to the IK and E to the minus IK, the same thing for each of the particles, okay? So this is what you're computing, that's what you're measuring in the simulation. This halo model is, doing the, is usually doing the same thing. So this is the following thing. So clearly, when you look at what's going on, particles ac accumulate in these little concentrations called halos, okay? So um, 
And they have some size, uh, you know, fractions of a megaparsec. So if you're now computing the correlation function, the pro which is, or the, uh, the correlation function on small scales, meaning the chances that, that you have two particles separated by some distance, once you choose the distance much smaller than a megaparsec, this will, the two particles will be in the same halo, okay? Because this is the typical size of the halo. So if you think like that, clearly, the, the distribution of the separation of particles um, when the distances are very small is basically given by the chances that you are in, in a given halo of a given mass and then the profile of the density of the mass inside each halo. Because if you have two particles separated by a megaparsec, they probably are in the same halo. And so the correlation, how they, they are separated, depends on the density distribution in that specific halo. So. Um, so if you're doing something like this, it, uh, it, uh, it's good to do the following. You sum over J1 and J2 for particles that are in different halos. Let's do this in the simulation. All right? J in different halos. And then plus a sum over halos of particles, just the pair, the, the two particles inside of the same halo, OK? J1 and J2 in the same halo. So. I split the sum in this way. This is what people call the one halo term. So the two particles in the same halo, the two particles in different halos, OK? So great. So um, and, and, and um, yeah, so, so this part um, of this, is, this one is called the one halo term, OK? And this one is, the, of course, the two halo term, OK? And so what people do is the following. So first, we, will, we can get a simple expression what, of this, of, that relates this to the, the density distribution of the halos, OK? This one. And then this guy, people just replace, say, oh, if it's the two halo, I will replace this by the linear correlation function. Two halos are two, two separate. So it's some, some guesstimate of what uh, I don't know, make it up. So here, if, if you are very far away, probably the linear regime is good enough. So I just replace this by the Seldovich or the linear theory uh, power spectrum. And this one, I have an expression which is the following. So, um, so it's a sum over the halos. When you, and we are taking expectation value. So this will end up being the integral over the, the chances that you will be in a halo of a given mass. So it's some sort of, uh, uh, schematically, it's a formula like this. The, chance, the, the number of halos that there are per mass, integrated in mass, chances that you have two particles in this halo scales as the amount of particles in each of the, in the halo, but squared, because it's two particles. So there will be some m squared. And then when you look at this, you realize that, you know, what, what uh, you are doing this sum over the par two particles in the halo, e to the i, k, blah, blah, blah. That ends up being just the Fourier transform of the density profile inside the halo. So the formula looks like this. If, if, if all these halos have a universe, uh, some density profile who, whose Fourier transform I'm calling u of k, and that depends but perhaps on the mass of the halo, they have a different profile. So this is the formula for the one halo term. Uh, I leave you as an exercise to to uh, derive this, OK? And, uh, and this u of k and m is nothing other than the integral, or is related to the integral of the Fourier transform of the density, in the density of the halo, delta of k of the halo, or, the de or rho of k. The Sorry, rho of r, the Fourier transform of the of the uh, density profile. Okay, this is the standard you can find in papers. You can do it's not so difficult. Okay, so it's just what are the you, both particles need to be in the same halo. So this is giving you the chances that you have a halo of a given mass. How many part is two particles? So how many particles there are in each of the halos? In the in the halo, but square because two particles m square, and then the Fourier transform of the thing. OK, so, um, so um, good. So um, 
and so you, you write the formula like this, okay? And so you have the Seldovich, or and let's say you replace this by the by the linear theory power spectrum, or perhaps you want to replace it by something along the lines that we have computed. So what I want to tell you is, if you wanted to do this exercise, how you would have to replace things. Because when you do it this way, uh, that's what people have done. People have done this, and then put here the Seldovich. Let's say my, my theory was not this EFT, but I just stop at Seldovich, OK? I don't know. That, that's the simplest thing that people have done. So you put it here. Now you discover something, something a little bit strange, uh, and that it doesn't really, when, when you do it, it doesn't, it doesn't work very well, and which is the following. The, you know, if I do this Fourier transform and I consider, let, let's just now look what happens at, as k goes to zero, okay? So, I, so k is much larger, much bigger, scale is much bigger than the size of one halo, okay? So when I expand this, this term, the lowest order term starts with one, okay? Which, when you do this integral, is just the total mass, okay? It's just the mass of the halo, okay? So, in other words, this thing at k going to zero goes to some sort of constant as a function of k. The lowest order is some sort of constant. And uh, so it's the constant times this integral. So you can predict exactly um, what, so, so you, you will find the, you know, that the, this term has some shape, but at low k it goes to some sort of constant. As, and that is just the, decays with k so slowly, being a constant, that just screws up the whole thing. Something is wrong, okay? So, I mean, um, when you look in detail, this constant is just too large. It's affecting things too much, okay? So what people have done, Uros and so on, is blah, 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 blah k square over something or other. I don't know, just some k0 square. They, invent, they, they write some paragraphs until you end up with some k square here, and then it's good, OK? But it's really, um, OK, it's really um, some paragraphs that you write. There, it, it looks nice, but I think they are pulling some, uh, OK. Because what's, if you, if you so, let, let, let me just tell you, let me just sketch for you what you should do if you want to do it properly, um, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll ask you to do it for yourself. So the, 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 the final formula that they have looks something like this. If you want to, if you want to um, follow that, the, the formula looks like this. The full P, okay, would be they do P. Seldovich, okay, fine, plus the one halo term modified by this uh, stuff. So let me just some function of K, which is some simple function like this uh, that makes this not go as K to the zero at low K, but decay, and it decays in such a way that it goes like K square, and it kind of fixes the whole thing, okay? Uh, and, and it fits the, the, it fits this formula, what is true is that it fits the measurements of the simulation very well, OK? Um, so that's the formula. But it, it's important. So if you look at this formula, we are trying, in some sense, to, to describe the corrections to the linear theory. Just my perturbation theory is Seldovich. So if you think of this, I would say, oh, P. Seldovich is what I'm using for my perturbation theory. And the error is everything else. This halo, this stuff, is this error, OK? So I'm somehow, this is somehow a model for, for what this error is, or the power spectrum of the error, OK? And as a conceptual thing, I think it's very good to think of the error as some sort of superposition of errors that you're making in each individual halo. And in some sense, this is what this is. So the logic seems very good. But I would say that you have to, so the, the two things that it would be nice to understand is um, if you wanted to have a better approximation for the large scales than Seldovich, but for example, our EFT that goes very well, how would you fix this? How would you change this? And is there some more principled way of getting this? Okay, because clearly the halo model, if you do it like this, it looks like you actually get that. 
And somehow, that's not, there's something fishy, with this because it seems that you get that, but, uh, but uh, it, it, it looks like it's not good. But I think, in reality, you don't get that. Or if you want, if you get that, you don't get P. Seldovich, okay? So the jump of inventing that here was P. Seldovich is where, where um, um, there is a mistake. And so um, let me tell you what you would have to do. So, um, so let's start by computing. Let's start by computing the, dif the let's compute for simplicity the difference. The, let's see the, the difference between the the, um, the 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 true delta and the delta of the perturbation theory. Okay. Um, so I will I will then so the, I will then then my um, as we were discussing, the, the power spectrum at the end will be the power spectrum of perturbation theory. Now, if I put here Seldovich, it will be this. But if I put something else, it will be whatever I use for the perturbation theory. I mean, let me just see, using the halo plus the power spectrum of the error, I want to use the similar logic as the, as the halo model to see if the power spectrum of the error looks like this that they are writing or what, 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 what am I? Is this what they are writing, what the actual power spectrum of the error is? And it's almost like that, but re so, um, so if you, so now, so let's write this. We, we said this d cube q. So this is e to the i k uh, q um, plus uh, s, mode, uh, s perturbation theory plus s error minus e to the i k Q plus S perturbation theory, okay? So this is the definition of this error, that I, the delta of the error, the, the density, over density because of the error that I'm making, okay? And so now, again, when you compute the power spectrum, you can think, again, as I was saying here, you are summing over, well, here I said integral in Q, but if you want sum over all the particles, okay, in the simulation. So you're summing over particles that are in two halos. This quantity is what you're summing in two halos or one halo. So this error, let's, concentrate, let's look at what the formula for the one halo piece of the error is, okay? So the error has two pieces, one that is a two halo term, one that is a one halo term. Is the formula for the one halo piece of the error, the actual formula for the actual error, does it look like that or not? Does it have this, uh, um, this k square there, OK? So I leave you as an exercise. So l l let me just, uh, you, you can follow the algebra by yourself, but let me tell you what's happening. So I told you that when you do this calculation in this way, you ended up with this integral and the profile of the, of the halo, OK? Now you can see that here is really something about the difference between these two. So I'm not going, at the end of the day, I do not get the profile of the halo, but I get the difference in the profiles between the two, the halos as computed in perturbation theory and the real halos in the simulation. So the actual formula that you get like that is, um, is this formula. It's the same formula here. But if you want, is u of uh, perturbation theory minus u of the simulation. This is the actual formula that you get, honest formula. OK? But now uh, comes the following. Uh, so now, what, what about this uh, difference? How does it depend on k at low k? So remember, this is the Fourier transform e to the i k r of the density of the halo as computed in perturbation theory minus the same thing computed in uh, minus the same thing with the halo that you computed in the simulation, OK? This is what's entering in the actual formula, OK? But now you see, if I expand, and this was integral dq bar, OK? So if I now expand in k, in, in the, as I was doing before, to get the low k limit. When I put one here, this gives me the mass. But both halos have the same mass, OK? So I, I've split them. I, I put the same particles in each halo as calculated by the simulation. As so it's the same particles. So 
the mass term cancels out, okay? So this term now no longer starts as, as uh, k to the zero, okay? So the, the k to the zero disappears, okay? And now, um, furthermore, if I, um, if I now expand the first order one, there's an r here, r times rho. That's the position of the center of mass, okay? So the, the first term that appears there is the difference in the positions of the center of mass. But because of momentum conservation, inside, even if you're getting screwed up the, the, the forces between the particles, momentum conservation means that the center of mass is ended up in the same place, no matter. So again, now there is another cancellation. Because of momentum conservation, the k term also cancels. So this difference starts in the Fourier transform as k squared, okay? And then here goes the, the, the square of the thing. So the actual thing that you get is k to the fourth, okay? Proportional to k to the fourth. And for those of you th that are, you know, already have done some calculations of this, this is the same k to the fourth. It's the same reason that the, k, the stochastic term goes like k to the fourth, so mass and momentum conservation. So this term, actually the one halo term, is really k to the fourth down from the standard calculation, okay? And so at low k is super, um, is super um, small, and it doesn't really affect anything. As, so remember that Uros was putting here a k square to kind of fix the whole thing, okay? So now, uh, because it was doing too much damage, so you needed to cut it off. But now with this k to the fourth, this is not doing anything. It's super small, okay? So, okay, now, great. So we no longer have the one halo term doing a lot of damage, but now it's not doing any helping either, okay? Because it's now too small. So where is the k square term? Okay, the k square term is the k square that I discussed before, which is really inside of, so the p Seldovich or the p perturbation theory has a k square term here. That's the k square. That's the reason why he put the k square term here. And then, but however, you would say, but wait, wait a second. Here, he was putting something that was actual k square. Period. Okay, because this was some integral. Okay, and he put k square. Now I told you that the the correction, as as we calculated before, was k square alpha square p. 1-1, one, one. it was the, the, the P linear. That was, so I, I, I told you that we should correct this by 1 minus this times P, okay? So the actual thing, so, so he said, oh, I put K square, I fixed the whole thing, and it worked very well, okay? Now, but I say, oh, good, but you screw up the calculation. In reality, mass, and, you are really going like this, mass and momentum conservation, so you go to K to the fourth. So this guy is actual K to the fourth, is completely negligible. So his k square here, who plays the role of k square? Now I'm telling you, it's this guy that plays the role of k square. But this is not k square. It's k square p of k. But you see, if you look at the plot, p of k has the peak. And so it's almost constant in the place where this makes any difference. In the place where we are talking about the interpolation between these two regimes, this is roughly constant, OK? So, it works. The formula with the k square works. But I would suggest that it's all a coincidence, okay? And I believe in mass and momentum conservation and so on and so forth. So anyway, so, um, so I, think, um, I think there's some room for, for trying to put these two things together of the halo model and, and, and this EFT. If you, if you, and, and, and the way you would do it is, Regardless of what is the perturbation theory that you use, the, the, you know, th that just goes into, you carry it along and you put it here. And so I think you can, uh, you can do this kind of trick, not just for Seldovich, but for anything. And perhaps it's a good way to have some formulas that interpolate, that are designed to agree. Um, so this formula, as I've written it, at low k, if I do the procedure in this way, at low k, I'm getting exactly the same as the EFT because the, the one halo term looks exactly like the stochastic term. Everything is as you know, the theory tells you it should be at very low k. But then when you go at very high k and you're in the one halo term, 
then you are getting something of the form of the one halo term. And in fact, you are getting the standard one halo term when you go to high K because, because this guy, the perturbation theory distribution is much smoother than the, than the, um, than the real simulation. So this guy, even though as a, at low K they cancel, the first things cancel, but as you go to high K, this one is very small, it's much smaller because uh, this, this uh, is the Fourier transform of, of some big blob compared to the simulation thing that is like that. They have the same mass and the center is at the same place. So the first two moment, moments in K, they cancel. But as you go to high K, this one has support at high K. This one doesn't. So this formula, when you go to high K, it gives the standard halo model answer, which is a good answer. Oh, it's roughly a good answer. So anyhow, so I think um, that was my answer to the halo model, how to put the things with the halo model. I don't know if, uh, I, I think for phenomenological purposes, it's useful to, to get the, this halo model uh, to work. Um, okay, so let's see, what else am I going to, I need to pick a topic of all these topics. Okay, so I think I have, uh, yeah, this is my plan. So I was going to talk about this, uh, uh, let me advertise, so um, um, this IR resummation, but I think Merdad is going to talk a little bit about this, maybe on Monday. So I will skip the, uh, and, and, I, and I let him explain these kind of things. But um, if, you, if you open the papers of um, um, Leonardo and collaborators uh, computing the, the power spectrum of, uh, of um, using this EFT in Eulerian space, it's slightly different language than the one I was using, but more or less the same. Uh, I recommend that you go look at this in, det in detail, but I just want to point out that if you look, so wh what is here is some measurement of uh, the, in simulations and the ratio between the power spectrum that you compute in this way and the one that, uh, that you get from the simulations. Red is the one loop with this EFT calculation. Two loop is the blue thing. The ones without the EFT are the other curves that go crazy at low K. So, um, so this is, uh, the, I think this is the state of the art calculation in some sense because they went to two loops and everything. But uh, the obvious thing in the, if you look at this residual, so if you look at the curve, you see all these oscillations, okay? So what, is, what are these oscillations? How come there, there's this, the residuals, the difference between the model and the measurement has all this structure, which of course is everything to do with the um, BAO. Okay, so it's all about the BAO, and um, this is our version of this, but uh, um, let, let me. So it's all about the BAO, and, uh, and here is an example in which um, I think uh, it is the case that uh, some of the diagrams, and they, are the di uh, 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 they, they, need to be, they need to be summed, or not all of the... Um, not all of the uh, terms in the perturbation, the fact that not all the terms in perturbation theory have the same amplitude um, is important. And, um, and, and furthermore, this is uh, in many respects something that is uh, very much, in, in a sense, in the linear regime, but you need to keep many terms to, to, uh, to describe it uh, uh, properly. And it's the, it's the fact, uh, and I, I let uh, Merdad or, Somebody discussed this in more detail, but um, what's happening is that if you look at the random motions of, uh, so remember that, let's see if I have the power spectrum of the displacements. So we have this peak of the correlation function at 100 megaparsecs. No, I don't have that. At, at, at 100, uh, so let me just leave this. Um, at 100 megaparsecs, so there is this preferred scale. Now there are, um, the, the, the motions from the modes that are shorter than 100 megaparsec move things around, okay? Um, but, uh, and, and thus move the peak. But these motions are of order a few megaparsecs, and the width of this, uh, of this uh, peak is 10 megaparsecs, so you are moving things by order the width. And so you make a big, you make a big, uh, 
uh, smoothing, something looks, so there's a, something that's not a small parameter in this perturbation theory, which is the size of these displacements compared to the width of the peak. Um, so, so that's not small, and so there's a bunch of terms in, per, in the perturbation theory that are enhanced by this ratio, so you better uh, look at them all and sum them all up, and you can do it, it's not, uh, you can find them all and add them. And furthermore, it's a particular, um, it's, a, it's a particularly um, safe thing to do. First of all, because w w the, the form of these terms, you know what they are, as I was telling before. But also, if you, if the, the other point that I want to make is the following. Remember that I had plotted the power spectrum of the displacement, the thing that was contributed to, the, to these uh, loops. Uh, and, it, and it, uh, the one three term. I said, the, the, this is the power spectrum of the displacement, uh, of the displacement, and it looked it had a peak like that. Okay, and um, um, so so most of the of the contribution to the displacement, when you when now let's ask the following question: When I look at the motions, the relative motions that uh, are smoothing the BAO peak. From what part of the spectrum of the displacement are they coming from? Which are the k's that most contribute to, the, to, to these motions? Okay? And of course, because of the shape of these, these are k's along. So these guys are more important than these guys. Okay? But the nonlinear scale is somewhere here. Okay? So the motions that are, that are, because of the shape of the power spectrum, of the displacement, the modes that are doing most of the displacing are modes that are quite in the linear regime, for which doing the nonlinear corrections for them, for this, is a very small effect, percents and stuff like this. So it's not, even though we would be adding, uh, you know, fishing for new terms and so on, it's clear that we don't need to, or it's not so important to, um, to make sure, think about the nonlinear corrections to the displacement itself, because the modes that are doing the displacement are very in the linear regime. The, so, um, so it, that's the reason why um, why this whole thing works. Because, uh, the, this IR resummation works. You know, th these are terms that are um, you, you know what they are. You can find them all. They are all enhanced. They are much bigger because they are enhanced by the width. Of the, by the size of this displacement relative to the width of the BAO peak, which is of order one, you know, it's a, it's a big thing. Uh, it makes these corrections of order one. Uh, but they are still being done by modes that are pretty much in the linear regime. So this is some sort of coincidence of scales, okay? It's not, it's the width of the BAO peak, its location, which is, which is what sets which modes are the ones that start to contribute here and where the nonlinear scale compared to the, to the peak of the matter radiation equality. These are all kind of, uh, you know, coincidence specific cases of our universe. So it's not that you should always trust this resummation. It should always work on a first principle, some first principle thing. No, it's just in this particular case, these diagrams that you know which one they are and everything, blah, 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 are the most dominant one and they are very much under control for all of these reasons. But if you start shifting around where the BAO is with respect to the nonlinear scale, make the width of the peak not so narrow and stuff like this, then no longer is true that you, that, that, that you are, would be under control and you should add all of these guys up. But, uh, but uh, anyway, so that's an example of a, a specific set of diagrams that, uh, that uh, um, let me, that, uh, that it would be good to include, and in a, in a way, you, you, even when you make, say, the one-loop calculation, you are doing a one-loop calculation plus a bunch of other diagrams, some specific ones, and they are exactly, they just re remove all of these oscillations, okay? So, so this, uh, um, um, yeah, so, 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 um, so, okay, so, so, that, that, that's all I want to say. It was just an, an, an advertisement for, for, um, 
for Merdad's talk. I don't know what he's going to talk about, but I will advertise as much content as possible so he will get in, in trouble and he cannot cover anything. So, uh, okay, so, so let me just, uh, to finish up, I don't know, so I, I skipped over this IRS summation. Let me just uh, um, um, give you a, a couple of applications. Um, I'll advertise a, a couple of applications of these kind of ideas, more concrete applications than, concrete in the sense that they might be useful for, um, even for, uh, even if you just want to say, okay, I want to measure the power spectrum of, of, uh, of, uh, of the density field in simulations, let me just tell you how you know, the things that we have uh, discussed can help you do this much better. Even with the same simulation, you can do it much more accurately, or you can know the actual final power spectrum of, uh, or in, in the real universe much more accurately, even with the one, with the same simulation, if you're a little bit smart about how you measure it um, using this kind of idea. So let me, let me let's see, what, what should I... Um, I want to show you some plot. Let me see if I have this plot over here or not. No, I don't have it in this guy. Sorry. Um, okay, so so um, let me. Perhaps this is the last thing that I'll do. Just an example of some completely. So this is just to show that perhaps if you if you gain some better understanding of how things are working, maybe it's useful even for some more practical thing like measuring the power spectrum of in, in a given and body simulation. So, so uh, what's happen the question is the following. You have an in body simulation and you want to measure the power spectrum, so what do you do? A power spe so what you do is you take the density field in this simulation and you compute delta uh, for different Fourier modes, okay, delta of k, by putting all these particles in some grid, going to Fourier space, computing the density field, and then the power spectrum is supposed to be this expectation value of delta of k, delta star. What you actually do in the simulation is you take all of the, you've measured the, the, the Fourier transform at some specific values of k in the simulation. You take this and you convert this expectation value by summing, or you calculate, estimate this expectation value, your estimate for P of K is uh, just sum over the, so in, in the simulation there will be a lot of Ks, you look at all of the Ks that have a specific magnitude that you're interested in, this some, some shell in Fourier space, you add over all the modes that live in this shell, okay, that has to do with the K you care about, you, divide, you average the, 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 the amplitude that you see there's a certain number of modes there, nk, uh, in that shell, and you average, you square the amplitude that you measure in the simulation, you average, this is your estimate for this expectation value, okay? So in other words, what you're doing is you have the simulation, you, uh, that's a, a specific realization of, of what the universe might be, so you start with some random initial conditions, you measure what you evolve to the present day, you then calculate the values of these coefficients uh, of this Fourier transform and all the cases that you're interested in. You average them out. That's your best guess of, uh, of the power spectrum at this particular value of k. This is the standard thing to do. A any, any question about this? No? So this is what you can do, uh, or what you usually do. And, and um, how well... So let me ask you a following question. How, uh, maybe somebody can, if, if, you, if you have some simulation and you've done this procedure, how, how well do you know the power, how well do you know the power spectrum? You know, what is the error that you have? Why is there an error? It's because you had some specific initial conditions, some random example, but you had only a, a finite number of these Fourier modes in your example. So, there is some sort of sample variance. This is the equivalence of the cosmic variance now that you're an observer of this little universe of the simulation. It's still a small universe. You only have a few number of modes. Then you cannot know the full expectation value perfectly. In this simulation, you will have some error, okay? 
What's the size of this error? OK. You can, if these are Gaussian random fields, you can square this, take expectation value minus the, the, the expectation value of that uh, square, and you discover a formula that looks like this. Anybody wants to guess? Sorry? Well, it's, yeah, exactly. So the formula is like this, OK? So that's, that's what you get, OK? So in the, in, the for, in the plot up there is some measurement in some particular uh, and then you, you can do this for one simulation, or if you have 10 simulations, you do also average over the 10 simulations. So in order to, to, um, to uh, measure this, OK, you, you uh, as many, as, as most, the bigger the simulation or the more simulations that you have, then you have more modes, then you have a better. And so that's an example. Up there, some specific, um, some specific simulation. I don't remember how big it was. The, the, of course, the errors uh, are set by how big the simulation was, but I, I, it, it doesn't say in the caption, and I forgot. It's not particularly big, but you can see those error bars are just this, OK? Or probably they were gotten by comparing the answer that we got in 10 different simulations or something like that. So that's the errors that you get. Now, with the same box, I claim that if you're a little bit uh, smart about it, you can uh, get the, the points at the bottom which are the exact same, this is the exact same simulation. Uh, so, okay. And the ratio between the sizes of these error bars as a function of k is plotted here. Uh, at, there's different curves or different sets of points uh, that I will explain to you what they are. But, um, but uh, um, you know, it the, the looks like improvements of factor of 10 to 100, okay? So um, how is this possible? Um, so this, in, in any case, if any of you ever is going to measure, let me advertise that if any of you is ever going to be interested in measuring power spectrum in simulation, I advertise that you should do this, not the standard thing. This, of course, is the standard thing. Everybody does this for some reason, but I think you can do much better, okay, with the same simulation. You only need to do something that I will tell you in a second. Any question? So, um, okay, so we are going to use what we have, uh, what we have, uh, uh, what, 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 we, um, what, what we already, we, what we have been discussing, and is the following, that the delta um, in the simulation, we know that delta in the simulation is delta of perturbation theory for that box, multiplied by some, uh, let, let me call this, this one uh, minus k square, alpha square, whatever, I'm just calling you some, some transfer function, plus this delta mistake, okay? We have this model, okay? Um, and I want to use this understanding that we have in order to make the, the measurement much better. How am I going to do it? The, the reason of this is the following. Um, what, what I showed you, um, before was that um, um, the difference between um, delta of the simulation minus R delta of the perturbation theory, this guy, which was what I was calling, or the other, what I was calling the error, power spectrum of the error, this over the power spectrum of the simulation was a very small number. I forget, uh, I should bring up, but remember this number that, um, that um, well, it, it things maybe like, uh, well, maybe this one is a good. So these are examples, but, but you know, it's at the 10 to minus 4 level. Just this ratio, if you go to 0 0.02, 0 0.05, this is minuscule, okay? A very small, a very small difference between the perturbation theory and, uh, and the simulations. What does that mean? This means the following. This means that this guy, okay, remember, this guy is just a non-stochastic function. It's just something, in, in the EFT was like this, alpha k squared. But here I'm generalizing because for the purpose of this, I just want to measure the true power spectrum. I don't want to have a method that relies that I know the specific form, okay? So I leave this, the form completely empty, uh, free, okay? 
But this is just a function of k. It's not a stochastic function. So for every simulation that you can imagine, you have to determine just this, let's say for, for the case, just one, for a given k, one number, this r of k, all of the modes in every simulation, if you tell me the initial conditions or the perturbation theory one, the one that I'm going to measure is this non-stochastic thing, this parameter or, 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 or thing times that, okay, uh, plus something that this is the real part that I don't know, the stochastic thing, the mistake is the stochastic thing that I don't know, okay? So what are the two things that I don't know? I don't know the error and I don't know this, okay? But let's just do the following plot, okay? But the point is that the size of this error is very small compared to this. The, the ratio of this power spectrum, which is the variance of, of this, is 10 to the minus 4 or something like that, very small, okay? So let's just imagine that you that you, um, that you um, plot delta nonlinear and delta perturbation theory in a scatter plot, okay? So there will be, in, the, in, a, in a given simulation or in many simulations, what you will see is the following. They trace each other, you know, they, there are points, you will see points like that, okay? Um, that trace each other linearly with the coefficient, this is for a given k, so this is just a number. The coefficient here is this r, is the slope here, and the departure from this is the error, okay? But what I'm saying is this error is very small, is percent, so ten, the, the powers is 10 to minus 4, so this is really a scatter plot that looks like this, okay? Now, when I measure this cosmic variance, uh, so then you ask the question, okay, so w when, when I got this cosmic variance for the power, the reason I was getting the cosmic variance was because in different simulations, I have different values. You, there is this distribution of the possible values of the perturbation theory, okay? But in this plot, there is, first of all, the first statement is that for the measurement of the slope here, there is no cosmic variance. Let's first turn off this error. Imagine the error was zero. Then what you would get? There is, everybody follows in some line like that, a perfect line. In, in different simulations, the value of the delta that you have in this realization is different, okay? But they always fall on this line. So even with just two points, you know what's the value of the line. So I don't need a lot of points to measure r. I just need one, because it always goes to zero, okay? So in some sense, I basically have no error in the determination of this R. The only reason I really have an error is because of this mode coupling thing. So the mode coupling, the, or sorry, the error thingy that makes, puts a scatter here is the thing that's preventing me from knowing R very well, and then the more modes that I have, the better I will be able to measure R. But the error of R is then it will go as the square root of n, but suppressed by some sort of p error over p simulation. If the p error is very small with just two points, I know R perfectly, okay? So the error in this part of the, of, so if I express my delta in this way, the way, the, the error I can, um, with which I can measure this is basically, um, to do just with, it's, it's not one over the square root of n, but one over the square root of n times something to do with p error over p simulation, so much smaller. So I, I can determine this part very well, okay? Equivalently, how well can you determine from a scatter plot like this? You know, try to convince yourself, first, what is the error with which you can get the slope? And you will find something, I can write the formula, but it's, as I said, one over the square root of n and square root of the power, the ratio of the power spectrum. Uh, or the, the, the and, and the second one is how well you can, from this scatter plot, determine the power spectrum of the error, which is this size. That one, delta p error over p error, so now, just think of this example, p error is just, now it's a bunch of Gaussians, a Gaussian with some error that you add and so on. This one will be two over the number of modes, okay, that you have. 
And then if you look at the, at the um, I think this one is, uh, again, 2 over, or something like that, 2 over the number of modes, square uh, P error over P um, nonlinear or something like that. This is, the, this is the relative error with which you can measure the two things, OK? Now, why is this useful? Because now we know that, um, so from the formula there, P of the simulation, the full, uh, now we take the, uh, I want to compute really the expectation value over the power spectrum over all, if I could run infinite number of simulations, the full expectation value. This guy, I don't need to run simulations to compute it. The, power, the average power spectrum, of this is an analytical thing. For example, if this is a Deutsch approximation, there's a formula. I integrate the, no problem. This is not a stochastic thing. Uh, the, the power spectrum, so the, the final power spectrum in this formula is R squared P of the perturbation theory plus P of the error, OK? So I use this formula to try to estimate the full, as the full average nonlinear power spectrum if I were to run infinite number of simulations, what it will be. So it, it's going to be given by this. And now, rather than, in other words, rather than measuring this from my simulation, I decided to measure R and P error, OK? Now, P error is very small, OK? So even though the relative error of P error is 2 over number of K, this is just so, such a small contribution to this that the fact, let me step back. If I measure in the standard way, the relative error that I get is 2 over the square root of the number of modes times this. That's the relative, or the relative error is 2 over the number of modes. Now I get that same relative error, but for the error power spectrum, which is a 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3 contribution to the total. So that is irrelevant, much smaller than the other, than the, and then I have the error in R. But again, the error in R is suppressed. Now this time by the square root only of the power space. But it's suppressed by the reason I was trying to illustrate here. If everything falls in a line, if there was no P error, I can measure R perfectly with only one point. Okay? This is not a stochastic thing. This is, so this I can measure with a much smaller relative error than, than and this also, I mean, this with the same relative error, but it's a negligible contribution. So the error, the variance of this thing is very small. In fact, it's the blue curves like there, it is right there. So in other words, I, in, all I'm saying is the following. The, we know another way of, 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 uh, of, of saying this is the following. Were I to plot the correlation coefficient between simulation and perturbation theory, it would be very close to one at these kind of scales, OK? So if the correlation coefficient was one, it means that, the per the correl that there's not a stochastic relation between the two things. They are, if I know one, I know the other, OK? So the only reason, and second of all, the perturbation theory average power spectrum, that I can compute without doing any simulation analytically. I know it. Okay, so if I know that the simulation is just a rescaled version of perturbation theory, and I know this analytically, then I should know the answer, the average power spectrum of the full thing, perfectly. The only reason why, the only reason for why I don't know it perfectly is to the extent that the simulation is not identical to the perturbation theory, that there's some mismatch. But I just already showed you that the error, this mismatch, is very small. So in any, in any what, it should be the case that if you're measuring things, um, your error should only come from the part of the, of the answer that you don't know. The part of the answer that, whose average you know cannot contribute, right? And in some sense, when you're measuring in the normal way, you're getting a contribution to the error from the fact that in a given simulation, the average of the perturbation theory is not the same as the infinite average if I had infinite simulation because I only have one simulation. But I know how to take the infinite average, so why am I paying this price? It's, it's silly, okay? 
I hope you are getting what I'm trying to say. But anyway, so that's just an example. If, if you know how to rewrite things in this way, you should be able to do much better. And especially for us that we are trying to, to uh, compare with the simulations. Uh, we, in this EFT where things are, we are trying to deal with 10 to the minus 4 effects and so on. If you measure the power spectrum in this way, you're host because you have super big errors, okay? And you cannot compare because of the cosmic sample variance of the simulation. But you should, we should know the power spectrum much better than that. Uh, we know it. When we are doing these comparisons, when I, when I was saying I was comparing at the level of the fields and so on, it's because I was trying to get around this. And it's another way. I was basically doing the same as this in some other way. But, uh, but this, I think, is a general point. If you're measuring some statistic from the simulation, it looks you have some analytical thing which you know is very well and whose only stochastic part is a small fraction, the only error, and you know how to take the expectation value of this analytically or in some way, I mean, in some way, you shouldn't pay for the cosmic variance of this in your measurement of the full thing, okay? Yeah? Yes, so what happens? But important point is that, um, so l the actual formula, so, okay, so for example, the formula for R is just the standard way of measuring, so you would measure in the standard way, delta nonlinear times delta perturbation theory over delta perturbation theory in your realization, right? So you measure this, for example. This is how you would measure R in the standard way. But this, because, because it's this ratio, it cancels a lot of the cosmic variance. But let me just say the following thing. So there's, there's specific formulas to, to measure this and to measure that. And the, the, um, those formulas are unbiased. Even if the perturbation theory is complete junk, I will get the right answer for the power spectrum. I will not get any improvement. Okay, so, and you can see it in this plot. By the time you go to K of 0 0.2, 0 0.5, this, this improvement factor is one, is nothing. So this is the ratio, so there's no improvement. So, but the, 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 this is a rewriting of the formulas. It gives the same answer, right? It's not that I'm inventing the, I'm measuring the power spectrum as it is, it's just that I'm not gaining anything because what will happen is that in that part, this R is very small and this delta error is very large. So the full uh, error is dominated. So this term that here I said, oh, it's a very small fraction becomes an order one. It becomes the full thing. And so I, I, so this is a method. It's not a method that assumes that if perturbation theory doesn't work, it will lead you to the wrong answer. This is just gives the right answer. It's, it's another rewriting of the average of the things. Uh, it gives the right answer. And in the cases when it happens to be that the perturbation theory is very close, then you get big improvement. Then the improvement is nothing, but you don't, you're not making a mistake. Yeah? For bispectrum and things like this. Yeah. So in this in this uh, example, um, you, you you can see that. Um, okay. So definitely. Maybe, are you asking what do I put here? Maybe I can put different perturbation theory and I can get better. If I put linear theory or one exactly so. You see there are three curves there. Um, the, the triangles is if you put here linear theory, Eulerian linear theory. Uh, the dots, if you put the Seldovich approximation. The triangles, if you put 2LPT, which because it's doing better, you are making more improvement, OK? So definitely, um, definitely, um, if you can have a better model here, you get a more improvement. Now, the flip side to that is that Computing the, uh, for example, if, if here you put the linear theory Eulerian or the, the linear theory Lagrangian, which is Seldovich, you have even an analytical formula for what the average of this is. Once you start going higher, then you don't have an analytical formula. You have to measure it by running many 2LPT simulations, which are cheaper than the real simulations, so you can get this average much very well, 
but, but you don't have an analytical formula. So you can definitely do better, as this thing shows, um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, but at some price. Uh, so, yeah. Well, it's k to the fourth, but I don't, um, you know, p error goes like k to the fourth. But in any case, whatever it is, this, uh, this method is not assuming what it is. It's measuring it, OK? No, but yeah, no, but think of it in this plot, OK? So for each, for each, so in Fourier space, you divide it into little shells of Fourier space, which you are measuring the power spectrum at this k, at this k. So you have all the cells of Fourier space where you have different measurements. You do a scatter plot, OK? So the two quantities here, one of them is the slope. And p error is the, the width in the direction, you know, like that, around the line, OK? This is, this is, and you do this for each k. So how this, you don't, I'm not assuming anything about how this depends on k. Even for a fixed shell, just one shell, I look at this scatter plot and I see an angle. And it's very obvious what, it's very easy to measure, at least at the beginning, for a low k, what the angle is. Because it's really very narrow. This, it's, it's, this p error is very small. This, this width is really very small. Everybody goes, in other words, the, the, the variance, this guy, so if, if you project this is some sort of Gaussian distribution. The variance of this divided by this variance of this thing, the ratio of the variance is 10 to the 4, okay? So it's really a narrow thing. So it's very obvious what is the R and what is the scatter. I'm not, I don't need, this is how these two things are defined, as the angle and the scatter. They have nothing, I'm not assuming how they depend on K. I'm not assuming that is the EFT form, nothing. I just, whatever I invent here, I plot it, I put it in the X axis, I put the other in the Y axis, and I fit these lines, okay? I'm not, I'm not if, if I put here something worse, what will happen? the correlation between the answer and the thing is going to be worse. And so rather than having like this, it will become more scattered because there's a bigger part that, that I don't know how to, is a worse. So the worse this is, the bigger the scatter this is. And so remember that a contribution was, the scatter I can only measure it to 2 over n, okay? And so the bigger this scatter boils down to a bigger error here. So I'm better off if I can find a better thing here. But if it's not better, I mean, it's, I'm not going to go wrong. I mean, it's not going to give me the wrong answer. Yeah? In what sense? Um... Well, um, the part of the cosmic variance that, that comes from this guy, the part of the cosmic variance of the simulation that comes from this guy, yes, I know perfectly. Because to the extent that this perturbation theory I know, then the variation of this multiplied by this gives me the variation of that. So, but this error is the part that I have no idea how to compute with perturbation theory. So in this case, I'm using the simulation. So this scatter around this, I mean, maybe I can have some sort of guesstimate of typically how it will be, but I don't have a, I'm measuring it. Yeah, in, with this I measure both the error and the slope. So the error is the scatter here, this delta error. So yeah, that's how it is. Uh, 
Um, you are saying that perhaps. Um, Um, I think yes, but uh, so you, I think you can think of, uh, I mean, these formulas that I gave you for, for um, um, well, okay, so, good. So the, the formulas that I, that I gave you for, or I didn't, or I give you the R1 and so on, is if you assume this, um, if you, if you, you are, you are, um, Determining this by, by computing some sort of chi square between delta nonlinear and R, delta perturbation theory square, minimizing this. Okay, if this were really very non-Gaussian, perhaps there is a more optimal or a different way of estimating R. Okay, it's possible. Um, yeah, I haven't thought about it. On real data, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the simul. Okay. The, 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 um, in principle, yes. This is you know the simulation is uh, like a fake universe, so it's the same. So the same method will work in for real data in principle in the following sense that. Uh, um, but, but notice that if I, when I'm doing this, I'm correlating the full, um, the full density field with the full, pre predicted, full predicted density field for that region of the universe, right? That, so um, n usually we don't do that. We just calculate the average of this and the average of that and try to match them. So in order for apply a method like this, you would need the, so here I really use the fact that I, was, I knew the initial conditions. And, and so I know, if, if I didn't know all the phases, then I couldn't be able to do it. Now people have, uh, so that's another application of this type of things is, uh, so if you, um, if you, um, to the extent that the full answer is just some simple thing, some simple rescaling of the perturbation theory, and the perturbation theory is something that you can compute fast, people have started using this kind of technique to try to take, say, the Sloan survey and actually um, search over all the possible phases and all the possible amplitude of all the modes in this region to get what are the actual initial, because you can do this relatively fast because it's almost linear theory. And, uh, and so then they reconstruct the actual initial conditions in this region and so on. So perhaps uh, there's some way of using that, and, uh, but I don't know. But you, 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 I, I suspect that, that, that it's too much to ask because I'm not told what the initial conditions are, but uh, um, well, um, but things that are more, okay, I can make some connection with something similar. Uh, you, you, you remember when we were looking at the, at the variance of the local FNL estimator, okay, where the, 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 naive, the naive thing had a lot of variance, mainly because you didn't know what the long mode was doing. Now, if you knew it, then you can divide. So this is saying that in some cases, you might be able, perhaps not for the powers, but if you measure the field and you're trying to measure some three-point function, given that you know the field, you can predict the three-point function in perturbation theory for that thing, and, and you will get something better, which is similar to this in spirit. Not measuring cosmic variance, yes, yes. Okay, so um, le le let me just stop there, but I can take questions, yeah. Again, again? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. And your sigma square is having no k dependence. Um, the, 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 the sigma square that entered in that formula, yes, was not, not, not okay. dependent. But what has a k dependence is the term. Uh, so remember that there were two pieces, the, the p error, and that one has a k dependence. Yeah. Now, does it mean that your because you're getting a correction by k square sigma square, then the profile of this part is always like one one k square? Um, good. So, um, yes. Yeah, so the the this effective theory is telling you the shape. So basically, I told you that this a one. At low k, the effective theory is telling you that should be like some sort of parabola, OK? It also tells you about all of the other ones. And they are more, some of them are like this. Some of them can start with a constant. So but they give you some rules as to how the eyes have to be. And they are something that looks like. But, but the effective theory all, only tells you some sort of uh, the, the shape of this in basically some sort of Taylor expansion, OK? So by the time you get towards the nonlinear regime, the details of how this is going, you don't, you don't really capture. So the, the, this EFT is only valid in the, for k much smaller than k nonlinear. As you go closer to the k nonlinear, every it, it, background. These AIs and so on, they are well defined. I just measure them for every k. It's no problem. But the prediction from the EFT about what the shape of these things is is some sort of expansion in k over some k nonlinear. So it's good at low k, and then eventually it's not so good. So, so um, and, and you can see uh, this. Um, let me see if I can have some. Um, so, so, so. Um, so this is another version in some other, for Eulerian now, the power spectrum of this error. And you can see, um, you, you can see, um, the, the, I, I'm, I'm showing this to show you that, um, so linear theory, one loop, two loop, there are other examples, but it doesn't matter. As you, as you try to make it better, the error starts going down, okay? At low k, but um, I mean, when you go at high k, the, that curve is one, OK? This, this, each, each of these things is two orders of magnitude. So that guy over there is basically one, 100% error. And you can see that, yes, as I, as I do better this perturbation theory, I make at low k, far away from some k of 0.2, point something, I improve, OK? But at high k, I always do terrible. 100% wrong no matter what, OK? So this is uh, something that is valid on this side. And I can hope to get it better and better on this side at some level. But on the other side, it's not doing anything. If I want to model that part, I should think about the halo model, OK? Yes. Now, to consider small halo structures, can you consider to study in harmonic space in those inside those blocks? Um, meaning, directly measure um, multiple power. Yes, uh, of 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 the of the of the blobs or of the halos in the simulation. Um, yes. Um, OK, one thing to say is that um, my current uh, point of view, which is probably different than other people, but 
all of this story about the smoothing, about the Tau IJ, it's a waste of time. I think it's just, it's just to write some, but at the end of the day, in order to know the, the, the shape of the form of the corrections, I can know them by, uh, probably I can ask my dad and he can tell me at the end of the day what the shape, I don't need to solve any equation, okay? It's just, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's too much work, okay? And it, I think it gives you, perhaps it gives you the good motivation for, uh, you know, for why, um, why it, it is like that, thinking that there are, I mean, I, I wrote some of these things because I wanted to understand how it was going on. And for me, at that time, it was very important to me to think, oh, yes, it's these little blobs and there's this. But now I don't care anymore. <laughs> because I think that, I mean, the, the structure of this is set by this team. And I know I can ask him or that he would tell me the list and then I just measure them. I ask Tobias to measure them and they, he tells me. So I don't need to do, these calculations become too cumbersome, especially when you go to too, too many counter terms, too many things. It's just, uh, but okay, that's my, that, that, that's because I get, I'm, I'm lazy now. I don't like to do anything. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, so that is one comment about this moving scale. I, for, I now take it more as a, as a, um, as a motivation and so on. In, in principle, I think it's correct that if we go and try to actually do separate into little blobs, measure the quadrupole moment, it should still work. I don't say it's not working. It should work. But I also know that doing that program, it does a lot of work because while measuring these cross correlations, the way where it's trivial, it's the same thing as everybody's doing for, you just, while, I mean, for example, even uh, I think Leonardo at some point, he tried to measure this tau ij by actually going at the part, very complicated, I don't know. So, so and I, I don't particularly see that it's sufficiently worth it for me to do it or to try to encourage some young person to do it, but probably somebody should do it. Uh, but, uh, but I'm not encouraging them. It seems to me that you can, uh, you can do it. This other way is probably simpler and, uh, and uh, yeah, but I probably should work.